apologies for the if there's any echo i am like say in my car today um slight change of plan on where i was presenting um, i got as far south as i could before i realized that if i went any further i ran the risk of not having any 4g now i'm in particular going to talk to you more about diving on the west coast of scotland um I, it's it's one of my most favorite places in the world for diving um i rarely ever get out of the country to go but i'm always in out of my shoreline um so without further ado i think one of the hardest things there was about doing this talk was actually trying to decide which dives i was going to talk about because if any of you have dived on the west coast before you'll know that there's there's quite a lot of choice on your doorstep uh, if you know where to look and what i'm hoping through this talk is that i can hopefully inspire more divers this, i mean this has come at a really great time because let's face it we're now finally at a stage where we can start planning our dive and start planning our club trips getting back in the water and hopefully some of you will be thinking about coming up to scotland and maybe want to do something different might not want to do boat dives something that will cater for everyone and that's kind of what i've tried to put into this into this talk um so just there we go so a little bit more about me thank you for the introduction before mark um i started diving in well i started diving with bzac in 2010 when i joined the university dive club leeds university uh Sabatka club um, and i was pretty much hooked from the get-go started in 2010 and then by 2014 i completed my dive leader finishing off my last part of the lesson in the silly isles which was a which was a brilliant club trip down there uh, in 2016 i went straight into ifc from from sports diver and completed my open water instructor in 2016 upon the uh with south bzac south scotland and from 2014 i should say i actually moved up to oban to complete my masters up here and, um in doing that there was a, a small dive club dive club in i was in st andrews and i was also on the west coast of east and west coast of scotland got a bit of a flavor for both joined both clubs ended up staying in oban and never really wanting to leave after that so after my masters i came back did a year as a wildlife guide on the Isle of Seal. I uh, did a lot more diving as well while I was there. Um, but then also had the opportunity to begin a PhD at the Marine Lab at the Scottish Association for Marine Science. And it was just at that time they were looking for a new diving officer. So I took over as the diving officer for the Highlands and Islands Subacqua Club in 2016. And I only just recently gave up that role um, late, late last year. If if there's people on here from Scotland, hello. Um, you'll have probably seen me around. I'm as well as the marine environment specialist for Scotland. Um, you'll have seen me more on the regional training events as a local organizer um, for South Scotland, um, mainly in the in the instructor foundation course and the Pie and Thai over in Arica, um, which I still do now. So hopefully, when we all get back up and running, you'll if anyone's on the instructor route they'll start to see my face a bit more up there. Um, recently as well, I also became the Sea Search Scotland coordinator, one of four of us that are based around Scotland. And I've been getting my tutor wings as well. So if any of you have been doing the, the Sea Search course over, courses over winter, you may have been taught by me as well as a few others. Um, not that I like to multitask, <laughs> but I, I I like to keep my hand in where I can and do lots of different dive related things and marine life related things. Um, I'm a marine scientist now. I studied my PhD was in marine robotics and habitat mapping, um, which was mainly looking at with conservation and marine management focus. And as you'll know, there is a there's a hyperbaric chamber based at the marine lab um next to the marine lab which i'm also on the chamber team for that so yeah i've been here nearly seven years now um over 400 dives mainly in scotland um 
I got my as part of my PhD, I did some diving work, which is part of my other talk, which I talk about using the photogrammetry and the robotics and comparing them with divers. And it was through doing that that I got my HSE part four um, diving ticket as well. So I finished my PhD in 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 October, and since then I've got a job as a, a marine consultancy as a mainly a habitat mapper, but reason why I'm in this car, I also get to go offshore uh, around the UK doing various jobs, marine science related. So I'm like, say on my way to Hartlepool. So that's where I'll be skipping off to after, after I finish here. Um, so why the West Coast of Scotland for anyone who's wondering if I haven't said enough already, they, it, it's such an in incredible environment. Um, both above and below the water, particularly the west coast with its many islands, inlets, channels, sea locks. It's, it, it's got a very rough, rugged landscape and it covers a vast amount of area. And all this rugged landscape continues on underwater uh, to which we have this amazing complex bathymetry. And it's already down to the geologically active past um, particularly off the off the coast of of Scotland, over to Mull, where there were super volcanoes, and all of the geologically rich um, environments that those cause. Um, now, coupled with environmental conditions as well, we get very strong currents off the coast. We're in a really amazing position where we have warm waters moving across from the south and we have the cool uh, Arctic waters moving down from the north and where these meet, they're mixed, there's a lot of high energy movement and there's a lot of upwelling and nutrients coming to the surface. So this produces a lot of food and a lot of life for other life to feed on, um, which is my real main um, love of diving of the marine environment is going down and seeing what animal life is there and what's brought it to be in that place. Because of this underwater bathymetry, and these environmental conditions, we have a lot of very unique and diverse habitats that you don't find typically around the rest of the UK. Because we have these, these areas where the, the land typically drops down quite deeply, quite quickly, um, and we get these very, very deep sediments found very close to shore, which means that we have access to these species and these habitats that you wouldn't necessarily see unless you were much further off the coast. And another important thing about the west coast of Scotland is it tends to be a cut-off area for different species. So you'll have species that are at the most furtherly north of their range because the waters are getting too cold. Again, we've got that mixing of, of warm and cold waters. Um, in the summer, we tend to get between 14 and 16 degrees maximum on the surface. And then in winter, it will go down to four, five degrees in, in some of the sea locks. I think I got on my computer. Um, so you'll really get that. You'll get species here that you don't necessarily see elsewhere. You'll get the northerly species coming down into the area and the southerly species. And this is the, the area where they're all found together. And it makes for some amazing diving because what you have is, is, is the ability to, to go out, identify an area of ground of different sediment type that you want to go on and, and these different and, and amazing species that are, that are found there. Um, now, because it such, has such a wealth of marine life, I mean, the Firth of Lawn, which is a large area off the west coast of Scotland, is, is, is seen as second only to St Kilda in for its biodiversity. But it's not the only area on the west coast that is um, important for marine life. And Scotland in general is really paving the way for its network of marine protected areas. And I say marine protected areas loosely here because this encompasses all areas of protection, not just specifically those called marine protected areas. And Scotland has a network of over 244 sites and these are designated to manage and protect or even enhance and, and keep in a stable state, very wide ranging um, features, habitats, geology, landforms, species, all of some conservation or 
um, regional or or global um, significance. And another um, key aspect of of the marine life is that, and, and, and the features that are found here is that we have recognised um, eighty two habitats and species, and that are called priority marine features in Scotland. And there's a, you can you can download this list um, off of uh, the Nature Scot website and and see where you can find all these different beautiful animals and, and habitats to go and explore. Tends to be what I do when I go looking for a dive. I tend to go, oh, what do I want to see? And then I'll try and cater my dive to to that aspect. Uh, but there's, there's like I said, there's 82 habitats and species that are identified because they are either regionally rare regionally significant or then they, they could be nationally important so they, they they may be only found in a particular they may be very common all across this hemisphere um but in the uk this is the only place that they are are um found in this kind of environment where they're close to shore um and i put a few pictures of some of these um priority mean features just below um and because just to show that, that these incredible diverse species, these amazing habitats are available to go and freely dive from the shoreline. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy just to kind of jump in and, and go and, and see these, um, which I wasn't able to kind of pull every, uh, I could talk for hours on the, the different sites that you could go to to see these things. If you follow my Instagram or Facebook feed, you might have seen that I was bombing it around Argyle yesterday, trying to get some last minute shots of some of the entry exit points of the dive sites. Because I realised that I tend to take a lot more pictures above the, uh, below the water than I do of, of the dive site when I'm getting in. So that's Scotland as a whole. Throughout the whole of Scotland, we have these amazing marine protected areas, these amazing features. But I'm going to focus in because I live on the West Coast and I've been diving here for the last seven years. And I've come to know some of these sites really well and I hope that I can pass on some of that local knowledge to you and hopefully that you'll come up and bring your clubs up here and come and send me a message and say come diving with us which I'd love to do and and that you can actually go and explore these things for yourself so why do we shore dive um open I mean it, it says in, in the in the blurb of, of this talk that the Oban and the west coast of Scotland is very well known for, as a base for going off to do the wrecks of the Sound of Mull, um, very popular dive sites and that's fantastic. You know, I also go out in the boats and, and I do that sort of diving too. However, I wanted to stick to shore diving because I thought, well, you know, this is something that we can, we can all come and experience and do um, together and, and bringing groups from, from all over. And what's great about shore diving around Scotland, particularly the West Coast, is it is very easy and it is very accessible. Um, you can, we regularly dive all year round without a problem. Maybe on the worst days, probably of like the last couple of days where, I don't know if any of you have seen that our Tesco's is now pretty much underwater and there's going to be some like dolphins floating by any, any day now. Um, but there is something that you can pretty much dive all year round in any wind direction, in any condition. If you have a plan B, C and D to cover you, then you, you've got that option around here. And it really is because of that convoluted, differently shaped um, coastal area where some areas will be nicely sheltered, whereas some will be very exposed. And what I've tried to do is kind of select things that will give you a nice mix, um, should that be the case. It's also really low cost. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, you, you've come up with your dive kit, you've come up with everything you need, you get accommodation and, and you can, you know, just jump in the water, get your air filled each night at the local uh, dive centre. I can say these diverse habitats and features that I was explaining before, they are, you don't have to go out into the middle of the channel. You don't have to um, go out to 
little islands that are dotted around the place to find these cliffs, these walls, these features, these these diverse sediments. That they're, they're all there. They're all right below you. Um, and it really encompasses both the all these sea locks that we have around here and the coastal waters, um, which are all accessible straight from the road. Um, and there's a lot of the West Coast is really nice in that um, it's been catered for the camper vans for people to, you know, they, they don't want people to stop in the middle of the road and take photos. They actually want you to park on one side and come off the road. So, there's plenty of spots to leave your car and, and get in, and it's kind of useful to know where these are as well. But there's always considerations, and these should always be thought about. Um, if you get a bit complacent up here and you've lived here for a while, you tend to realise that you have to keep going north and north and north to feel more and more remote. But when you first move up here, it actually it is a really remote area. And when I've been away for a while or I've been in the city or I've gone to visit my family, I come back and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'm back and there's, there's nothing around me. So remember, it is a remote area. And these sites, that they, they are prone to have very deep water. We're talking 50, 70 meter cliffs in some places going straight down to the seabed from, from right, right by your feet, right by the shoreline. Um, the, the dive sites that you go into will pretty much have few or no facilities associated with them. If they do, I have, um, mentioned on them all. What I think is, is really nice is that if, if you're going to these areas and you're using these facilities, you'll, you'll park in the facilities, it's always nice to then um, go in and, and use them and, you know, have a, have a drink at the local pub, go and look at your pictures with a cup of hot chocolate or something in the local, the local inn. Um, and they really appreciate it because People around here, you know, they enjoy seeing the divers and they enjoy seeing people going out and, and enjoying the marine environment. Um, the thing with uh, the, this, this west coast of Scotland is very hilly. There's a lot of Munros, there's a lot of hills. And what this means is that when we're diving in sea locks, um, you can be very enclosed in there, which makes phone signal very poor. So it's always worth checking. Um, that you have signal when you go to these places and if not knowing where your last bit of signal was as well because you always like you know walking around trying to get your phone in to, to try and find out try and find out something um knowing where your closest chamber is so closest one to the area that i'm talking about is going to be the oven dive chamber and the emergency services there the open hospital um i did mention that we get very strong currents we get big tides at the minute. We're getting some really super tides. Uh, Etiv is full and brimming over at the moment. Um, so it's always worth checking these tides, checking for your springs and your neeps before you're, you're going into some of these sites, because certainly some of them are going to be quite uh, dependent on what state of tide you're going in. Um, your wind speed and your wind direction are going to determine which sites you're going to choose on which days and if you need to go to plan B, D, E or F. It's always worth knowing your sunrise, sunsets. These remote places, there's no um, uh, street lamps. So once it goes dark, it really goes dark. And the worst thing is trying to find, pick up your dive kit in the middle of the night. Well, when it, you know, in, in the winter, it's going dark about four or five o'clock. Um, the summer we get daylight up until almost midnight. You can come out of a dive at midnight. I've done that in the high summer and the sun's just going down and you can still see around you. It's amazing. And last but not least, Scottish weather. You can have five seasons in one day and still have to worry about the midges. And there is nothing worse than rushing into your dive kit and to find that you have a midge stuck in your mask when you're in your dive. So don't forget when you when you're diving around midges, give you give him your mask a good rinse before you get submerged. That's it can be a quite a uh, not a nice uh, experience. So Oban is the base that I've chosen for this um, because it's Oban's about eight miles from, from where I live. I live just on the outskirts. Class is the gateway to the Isles. It's got a, a, a large population, but this part of the world, uh, it's one of the largest towns other than Fort William and Helensborough, about 8,000 people, give or take a couple of hundred. 
if you come in my car, it's about two hours from Glasgow. If you come by train, it's about three. But it's a really nice uh, pass over the hills. They have the divers. They've got accommodation to suit all needs. You can stay in a hotel. You can stay in um, the backpacker um, uh, lodges. There's like special built um, cabins that you can go and stay in. There's caravan parks. There's there's all sorts. So really, you know, depending on what you want, there is plenty of choice around here for you to do that. And what's great about going and staying in Oban is that when you've had your days diving and you want to go and explore after, you've got this really nice hub. Hopefully all the pubs, the cafes and the restaurants will be opening back up soon. Plenty of choice um, to cater for everyone. Importantly, there is a distillery. So, you know, you can also get your whiskey fix while you're up here too. I recommend Little Bay. Um, and as well, you know, if, if you don't want to just do shore diving, there are the options of there's various boat boat dives uh, that, that go out from various points um, to, to do local wrecks or to go further up towards the islands of the Garvalax and the Firth of Lawn, doing something a little bit more adventurous. Also, it's a great hub for shore diving and you don't even have to go that far from Oban to get to it. So here is a general map of the area that I'm looking at and neither way you can see even in the bottom left of the, the map here and I've placed a little box around the dive sites that I'm going to show you and tell you a bit more about what's at each of those and really you're only looking at going um, at max 45 minutes out of Oban um, to the north for these sites up in, in Creeran and perhaps you know 10 15 minutes down to the south there now like i say there is so much more choice this was just a very small snapshot of the many 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 sites that there are available to go and dive here so again you know if 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 at any point you are planning a trip and you do want some advice and you you want to know any more information then honestly just just give me a shout and i can i can tell you any more details about some of the other sites around here as well if you live longer or you're after something in particular but these are the ones here that we're going to look at. And what you can notice from this site is that they're all in different aspects. Some of them are, are quite close to the shore, to the sea side of the shore. And some of them are in channels. Some of them are sea locks, very sheltered and in different directions as well. So it will help you choose what you want to do for those dives. What I would say to begin with is so we have a, a dive center in Oban, Puffin Dive Center. They run training. They have a nice big shop full of shiny objects that I tend to like to go and purchase. Uh, so I'm not allowed to go in there very often. Um, it's also a really handy place to go for those first checkout dives on that first day um, because there, there's still quite a bit. There's a bit to see there. And it's it's just somewhere that's really easy. You can there's lots of space. There's air you can go and get your tanks filled there as well each night uh, it's only five pound a fill it's only a couple of kilometers out of Oban. it's also a really nice walk down the seafront they've got otters on the shore there as well you tend to see seals and the odd whale has actually gone past i think they even had a humpback go past there like last year sometime it's crazy but it's, it's just a really nice gentle sight when you're first getting back in the water making sure your kit works just having something gentle maybe doing a few drills. It's got changing rooms, it's got toilets. There's an indoor area, like it's very comfortable. We do, we always do a lot of our training here just because of the very ease of it. It makes it a lot more comfortable for our trainees to go in and get everything done in there. And what's really handy, and my friends are making full use of it, is that there's a kit wash. So even at the end of your holiday, you've got somewhere, if you go there for your last dive, and then you can rinse everything off properly before putting it away. But it's really useful for, for that purpose. It's catered for all experience levels um, and it's not tidally dependent. If if you you can go in any state of the tide, neeps or spring, and you don't have to wait for slack, um, pretty much any day you can jump in. It's nice and sheltered because you've got the Isle of Carrara um, in front of it as well. Um, so you can go you can go deeper than say five meters uh, i think you can get to 50 in the middle of the channel it's just a long swim back so i put 35 because 
But what you're going to see when you're out there and the reason why you would maybe do this site, you wouldn't really need to go any deeper. As I say, it's a very sheltered bay. Uh, you can you can see the, the slipway I noticed there. So there's a slipway going in. It does get heavy boat traffic in the summer. So just something to be aware of. Um, but you can either walk in entry there or as you if you carry on walking up down the if I go back to this one uh, if you can see the bottom left corner with the, with the building in it if you carried on walking to the right there you would get to the end of the jetty and there's some steps and you can do a stride entry there which will take you right out into the bay a lot quicker that's kind of handy there if you've got any trainees needing to do a, a striding entry um, drops you onto some nice kelp there's lots of lovely bits to see in there. So the kind of habitat you're going to get here, uh, very low energy, um, muddy seabed. They've also got a very small, it's very easily missed, I have to say. And I've missed it on numerous occasions, but it is there, I can assure you. Rocky reef. And it has this nice kelp fringing it as well. So you've got a little bit of different things to look at. There's also a number of objects on the seabed you can come across and there's like almost like a zimmer frame object but it tends to have sea squirts hanging off it and a bit of like seaweed and stuff so that and and nudie branks on it now the marine life that you get there it's it's amazing actually because i've i've still not seen one but we get john dories on the west coast of scotland which kind of almost look tropical um but what you can see from this picture here uh, this wonderful picture of Rowan's uh, is uh, a tall sea pen. Now these can grow to about over a meter tall. They live in these very low energy environments in these big, squishy, wobbly, muddy sediments. So it's always good to go for a mud dive because you tend to find really cool stuff like this. It almost looks quite of an alien environment. But what's interesting is that you can get all three species of sea pen uh, in this in this habitat. So you have the tall sea pen here. And you have this this one on the right here is the slender sea pen. And then you also get what's called a phosphorescent sea pen. Now I'm told that if you turn, if you, if you dare to turn your torch off and waft it, a gentle waft, it, it does glow. Um, so there's always something to try. Um, so these are all filter feeding um, using their polyp tentacles to capture little bits of prey as they go past. And what they'll do is if they're disturbed, they'll shoot down into that soft squishy mud to get away from anything um i get also get bobtail squids quite a lot of them actually last last winter um there was someone one of my friends went in and said they were like you just couldn't believe how many there were i'd never seen so many before and they're getting up to all sorts of antics and the beautiful beautiful colors this one's getting um, bitten its last last legs on this one but they're still very bright vibrant uh, little animals Here's a John Dory that I was talking about. Um, we're getting more and more records of these being being sighted on, on particularly outside outside the Gallinac on Puffin Reef there. And they're just incredible. They're more like lionfish than, than anything that you'd normally see in the UK. Um, on the hull on the on the rocky reef, uh, you get these cup corals. Um, and also these uh, these starfish called bloody henrys. They always make me laugh when I see these starfish, and they tend to be like pink and purple and red in colour. And then some nice, nice nudie branks as well. Getting your eye in really close into the seaweeds, and you start to see like all these other little animals that are feeding on it. So the next site, and we're not going too much further. We're still staying in Oban, um, but I thought I would go over to Denali Point, which is by Denali Castle, which is also worth a visit. Again, this site can be dived, so you can see on the map there. It's just north of Oban on it on your way to a really nice sandy beach. Um, it's a, you can you can go to that site in all all levels of experience. You, it is tidally dependent. It's better to do on a on a neap on slack water, but I've been told that as long as it's a neap, you can you don't get into too much difficulty um, with currents if if you if you miss the slack. Um, but just to be aware, that is the way the ferry comes in and out of Oban from Mull. So it does get quite noisy down that way. So it's always nice to keep keep into that that bay. Um, and what you find, I don't know if you can see my cursor on here, but when the box, 
there, you're basically you're you're entering the water here and you're hugging the coastline going round to this point here. And as you get round, as you come a bit deeper, down to about 20, 15, 20 meters, you reach a point where there's lots of dead men's fingers, um, really nice mixed sediment, rocky reef again, um, very different life to what you get down at Puffin. This is more sandy, shelly sediment, a lot cleaner sediment, and it tends to be a lot brighter as well. And you can either, there's, there's two ways you can go. You can either carry on around this point all the way around if you've got good spins. And then you see there's a slipway at the bottom here. You can then come up there out of the water and then walk back to your car, which is it's a fair old hike up a hill. Mostly you tend to do part of your dive, come to this point, turn around and come back in like that. Um, entry, you, you park up, there's a little uh, parking spot for about two or three cars, but there's a, you have to cross the road to get to the little cliff that then you walk across. You can see this little path here going down to the shoreline. Um, but, so just be careful of the roads. It only holds about two cars, but you can park further away or leave your kit, drop your kit off and then leave your car elsewhere and then go back for it. It's a big way if it's, if it's busy. You can get anglers there as well, I should say. So just be aware of any fishing line. Um, but you can see here, you've walked through and then you come to this shoreline here and then you're following. This is the, the channel between Oban and Kerrera. And then you can just swim around that point there. Can be slippy. Um, and yeah, so just be aware when you're, it, it was very slippy underfoot <laughs> when I was walking to get some pictures yesterday. Um, so you can get down to 30 meters. It is quite a high energy site. So you get a lot of dead men's fingers and uh, they'll, they'll be growing on all the big rock, rock surfaces, a lot of exposed bedrock. But then there's also patches of shell and gravel in the sediment, which you get very different life growing on the rocks is what you do on the sediment. But just remember, if you keep the wall on your left and go around and keep the wall on your left on the way back. And what I love this site for is that as you get in, there's so many different colours and types of seaweeds that you go into um, that you can get kind of carried away, like looking at that rather than kind of going on to the rest of your diet. So I always tell myself, look at the seaweeds on the way back when I'm doing my deco and then go out and, and see everything that's a bit deeper first. Um, because it's high energy again, you get lovely hydroids and bryozoans. So you've got these, the, the, the bryozoan is this colonial animal here that's got these stalks, and then you have these hydroids, which are growing out on this long stem, tend to be a bit more tufted. I've got these little polyps again, like those um, sea pans that are filter feeding uh, out of the water. The beautiful large clumps of these light bulb sea squirts as well, which are really pretty to look at when the sun shines down and they just they're so translucent that they, they just light up. I mean, it's great how they have their name. It's perfect for them. These beautiful anemones as well, beautiful colours, um, the oranges and the browns. And then if you get in really and get your eye in, you start to see all the nudibranchs that are feeding on the ver various uh, hydroids. Um, so you get lots and lots of different different species of nudibranch. And so, uh, this time of year, start to see uh, dogfish egg cases about as well. Um, which this is just lying in and amongst the seaweed. This is like a nicely, newly, freshly laid one. You can still see the yolk. There's not much shark embryo showing in that at the minute. Over later on in the year, you'll start to see them and you'll actually see the developed shark inside moving about, like pumping the water through. It's quite amazing to, to sit and watch them. These are cool. These are um, chameleon shrimps. And they, they'll be different colours depending on what they're, resting on as well though i was reading a paper recently where they were saying that the the color can change gradually over time to match the kelp the seaweed that they're that they're resting on um, so these are really cool when you when you find them really hard to spot but they're they're really beautiful when you look at all the the detail in them you got the nice spider crabs um again they can you just don't notice them at first until you kind of really get your eye in and start to you see something move on a on a stem you think it was at the current no it's like a leg like kind of moving about and it's plenty to see 
So that was Denali. Um, next, we're going to carry on the same road. So we're still in Oban, still in the centre of Oban. And this next site was introduced to me recently. Um, as I've only dived it a couple of times, but I absolutely love it. And it was the last one I dived in before lockdown hit us again. And it's fantastic. It's a very shallow site. It's a beautiful seagrass bed. And I did not know that we, I'd seen seagrass on the, on the beaches um, after a storm, but I still had no real idea of where it was coming from. So it was like starting to wonder and I asked a few people and then um, James actually told me about, about this site, which is really close um, and really easy to get to. And because it's, it's so sheltered and um, shallow, it's suitable for all experience levels i would say you can go i've been in in high water i've been in low water um it is a quite a turbulent so it, it's very silty site um one of the times i went in hoping to map the extent of the seagrass couldn't see in front of my face uh i was completely blind so it's much better waiting until if you've got a period of uh, calm after a storm and, and starting to see quite clearly in the water it's really good then to go in and look, and look for these things uh, high water as well if you're in low water you're pretty much walking in half a meter diving in half a meter so your buoyancy skills have to be pretty good in that you need to be able to keep yourself down rather than bobbing up because it's pretty much a, a glorified snorkel if, if you go in um, at low water and this site is between two beaches uh, between Weeganavan We've got a little wee Ganavan on the south here um, and Ganavan Bay, which is at the top. Now, these these both are signposted and there's a big main road. Well, I said big main road. There's a road going up to them and it's quite busy. Um, so you just park on the side of the road here and there's access through a wee gate. And you just a little short walk across a field to get. So it's, this is the field here. Where is my cursor? So you're crossing this field here. And then you're getting in around here. And if you've got, got low water, all you want to do is try aim to where this island is here. And then just you're in about a meter or so of water. And the, it's only a small area, but it's absolutely stunning because there is so much life there that you don't see in this area unless it's within beds like that. And seagrass is, is quite an amazing um, plant. It's our only true marine plant because it flowers and um, this species is completely submerged um, Zospora. and it's yeah you, you get a lot of animals that you wouldn't normally associate nearby it unless unless you have this close by because they either live on it amongst it they are amazing um, habitats for sequestering so taking in carbon from the environment and keeping it contained um, they, the ecosystem engineers, they really help against uh, storm damage. They'll keep the sediment compacted, They're re really important. And there's a lot of work going on to try and reestablish seagrass throughout the UK. Because I've, I've put a little link there to the Seagrass Spotter app because it's a really great tool, not only for finding new seagrass beds, but for also reporting any that you find as well. So if you do come across any, you can pop them on there and then you can add your sighting to it. And you can also learn a lot more about seagrass than what I can tell you, because I'm no expert. Um, but so, yeah, so there is the there is the gate and you can see my little arrow pointing to just between those islands. You do tend to see a few little seals pop up around there. Quite nice. And lots of shorebirds. My van's going to feature a little bit on these pictures uh, just to show you where to park. There's a nice feature there with the boulder and the um, so yeah, you can just park on the side of the road there if you're happy to and um, head into the field. And when you get finally get underwater, so you can see is that this is quite a, a turbid environment. It's quite silty looking. This isn't like you see some of the seagrass beds on the south coast and they're clear. Um, it's very rare that I've ever dived this site and it's it's been clear, but I'm hoping that, you know, let's see how it is in the summer. Um, so it's mainly seagrass bed, but there is also bedrock reef um, and it's very sand, silty sand as well. So it's actually quite, um, as you get out to the bedrock reef, it's actually quite clear looking as well. Um, but there's, like I say, there's a lot of different animals and I'll just show you some of the animals that I've been seeing from the 
the last few times I was there. So we get these anemones, these snake locks anemones um, that attach on to the stalks of the seagrass. And then we get the clingfish. Clingfish are beautiful. There's different species that are really hard to tell apart because even the same species have got different colorings as well. They can be really hard to identify. Get these little uh, amphipods. I'm going to be told that's the wrong name for them. I did try and find out what they were called. I'd be really keen to know a bit more about these as well. Uh, and there's another clingfish as well on, on that piece of kelp. Um, now, what's interesting about these, these snake locks is that these snake locks here are beige brown coloured. Now, you can also get snake locks which are purple and green. They've got their purple tinges at the end. Um, now, this site's really interesting because it had both species also has, and I only found one piece, but one piece is enough, uh, had some merle. A merle, again, is another really important habitat um, because when you have, merle is a, a calcareous algae, so it's a plant, again, and it, it grows very slowly into these nodules that grow and grow and grow and then it breaks off and then it, it becomes part of, it builds up and becomes its own habitat, its own sediment type that a lot of other animals can then use. So it increases the biodiversity of sites just by being there. So it's really exciting because this could be like the future of our mill bed in this area, which I just find so, so amazing. Here's some more of those little anthropods. One thing I've been looking for I apologize if I'm getting dark in here, but the light is going. <laughs> I can put some light on in this car. Um, that's okay. You don't need to see me. Um, the so what we have on here is the stalked jellyfish. So these are jellyfish that have decided that they're going to attach to a point on a on a piece of kelp or a piece of seaweed. And what they're doing is they're using those sticky feeding tentacles to rather than free floating. Uh, like other jellyfish do, they're, they're attached onto a stalk and they're collecting particles as they go past. And I was actually reading recently that they prefer more silty environments such as this. And actually there's been a decrease in stalk jellyfish because our water quality is actually improving. So the, when you see some, some species of stalked jellyfish are actually quite uh, rare now, so it's really, uh, really good. There's, there's, tell, there's some really good sites out there to like ID between them to work out um, what species they are and if they're these um, ones that that are um, decreasing in population. Um, and it's thought to be that they actually. Ah, thanks for an eye support. <laughs> I just see it pop up on the screen. Um, so what, what the uh, what the stalk jellyfish um, potentially have is that they don't like the direct sunlight and that the the turbidity of the water is actually preferential to them so they might actually prefer these more silty environments and i was actually able to see quite a number of stalk jellyfish throughout this site all of different colors and a few different species as well i also get fantastic nudibranchs um along like moving around in you just got to get in it's like a little forest like a, i say forest it's like a meadow nice green meadow um, full of different different marine life. So moving closer to the bedrock reefs, there were these beautiful areas of dahlia anemones, um, really taking up whatever available space that they could. And these are beautiful, beautiful colours, and they were just all over the the seabed and on the on the sides of the rocks where the rock meets the sediment. And you tend to see that they're, they're kind of all clustered on the bottom. Then you've got these beautiful. Um, sea squirts, these colonial sea squirts um, that that grow in like a, a star shape pattern. Lots of sponges as well. Really nice to see these big thick sponges on the rocks. And this this here is the other, they're the same species of snake lock and enemy, um, but then the green variety. And again, that is that's apparently due to the turbidity of the water because these the greener um uh purple ones are taking um elements of of the food particles are, are using sunlight to photosynthesize and they're gaining chlorophyll pigments through that so the the, the beige 
variety are not are not necessarily doing that as much and so they're they're a different colour. So it's really interesting at this site to be able to see them both because you either get one or the other. So on on out of Oban, we're moving a bit further north. Um, we've gone close to Connell. Connell tends now. I don't know if uh, many people know or have heard many divers know or have heard of the Falls of Laura, but maybe they've not dived it or they've heard like crazy stories of underwater waterfalls that sweep divers down out like a, a big slide out to sea. So that is not the dive I'm suggesting that you'll go out and do. Um, we actually do a lot of shore diving from the Falls of Laura because it is the most incredible site. So the Falls of Laura is the is the terminus of Loch Etiv, where the waters is a Loch Etiv is a glacial sea lock, a very long glacial sea lock. When the waters come out, there is a very shallow sill just by the just on the other side of the bridge. And what happens is as the tide pushes in and out, all the water that's flowing through has to squeeze through a very narrow channel both ways. And what that does is it forces the water underneath and causes these amazing underwater waterfalls. And when the falls is in full flood, it's absolutely incredible. And it's really turbulent, and that's when the kayakers go in. When the divers want to go in, we want it nice and calm. It, this is a very tidally dependent site. We tend to take sports divers only into this. Other, I've started, there is a site that I can take ocean divers in, but you really have to know it to be able to know to get in and out of the right, right places. Um, so it's, it's advisable to be more experienced at this site and be comfortable with your buoyancy. Um, and be confident in checking your time as well, because this is a site that you really don't want to get your timings wrong. If you're in or out of, if you're in the water too late, you're not going to get a full dive. You really have to keep to the times. Um, sometimes there isn't even really a, a slack water at the falls. And once you start seeing that color of the water change, you really need to start thinking about, about heading out. So I'd always advise with this is if you're doing it for the first time, maybe take someone in with you, someone local that, that has done that site quite a bit and can guide you around there. Now the Falls of Laura, it's the, the sides of it are um, lots of narrow gullies and channels. And it's amazing that what you get here is tide swept channels that you wouldn't normally see other than in the in the center of the firth of lawn so what you get is animals plants that that grow here that, that are more attuned to life out there but you have them right there at, at your feet and it's it's such an incredible place um it's it's in like i say it's in south connell there, there's a car park there so what you'll see here so standing at the at the site you want to stay to the left of this pipe as you're going in where i've put this arrow in and you're heading round and essentially in uh to the to the falls but sticking close to the to the wall there and it's it's stunning you have these beautiful rock walls you, you go over this cliff onto this seabed that's like a bowl and in that bowl it's full of cobbles and pebbles it's like being in a riverbed and when you can hear them kind of moving as well and you get lots of um i don't know it's, it's just a very it's a very amazing very different place to be in and so there's lots of parking so i'd say six people max just because you don't want to get too crowded in there um and there's also there's the oyster in blue pot to get food or get a drink after it's a really nice place and you really want to be coming in and out of that dive in the same place so i've just got this little video here because what i want to do is just show you this is when you don't want to be in there oh that not play there we go so you can see the water bubbling up um so this is a you know the, the tides the tides ebbing and like the water is just pouring out of Loch Etiv. and as it hits these channels it upwells and moves and, and brings all that water bubbling to the surface just what is very much like a bubbling cauldron very similar uh, sometimes to what we have the world's third largest whirlpool off the west coast the Corrie which I used to tour guide in. Um, 
what you find are very similar experiences bubbling upwelling of water as it as it comes to the surface and like i say you really if you were to be still in then you'd be you'd be getting picked up halfway out you'd be at the breeder pretty much by the time someone was able to come after you so don't don't dive it in those conditions nice flat water um for, for the falls we tend to say it's it's slack tends to be an hour and a half after open high water as a guide but again it's just knowing going in with someone who's got a bit of local experience has done it before um who can kind of guide you and, and help you if you're unsure with that so what's it good for like i say this is an amazing tide swept channel with very different marine life than what you see in the surrounding area because of this energy flow because of this water moving out you can like i say for well, I've taken ocean divers into a separate section of it, and we've stayed between six and ten meters. Covered the, the rocky, uh, the bedrock is just covered in sponges and hydroids and nudibranchs, and this beautiful kelp forest. Um, but the the highlight of this dive is that we have, for whatever reason, um, spur dog. These beautiful sharks tend to come and rest in the falls at slack water very docile they're not moving about people who maybe seen spur dog or know of spur dog when they're angling or fishing will know them as they tend to be called pack hunters as with spur dogs because they they they, they hunt in packs and so, but when they're in the falls they're docile they're not moving they're resting it appears that they're resting and you can just you can come across these pretty much throughout the summer um on many dives you know starting from 10 all the they, they can be in the bowl at 25 30 meters or they can be just resting between 10 and 12 meters of water and they really are beautiful beautiful animals um so they they are the highlight they're the stars of of this dive especially for me anyway but you can you can really see. So one thing I'll notice is the color of these these pictures. It's so the waters coming out of Loch Etive are very fresh. It's a very brackish sea loch. Uh, it's got one of the highest water catchments. So the water tends to be very tanned, very brown colored. Which is why I say when you when you see the water changing color, that's when you want to be heading heading back out of the, of the water. But it has these very brackish water tolerant species as well um and you'll see these amazing sponge formations growing on the rocks lots of scorpion fish lots of bushy branching bryzoans and hydroids uh, lots of turf these huge anemones uh, sorry anemones huge nudibranchs um just walking around these tend to these um tend to eat uh, dead men's fingers but they're just most nudibranchs they you know they're tiny tiny but when you see and you see this one like you've like flipping it you know don't, not, you're not used to seeing them as big as that you get these nice crispy bryozoans as well growing um lots again these dahlia anemones there's, there's a we call one of the walls anemone wall because it's just covered in them intermixed with the sponges and the hydroids it's just covered in these and beautiful anemones and weirdly there, there is a wall of of dog whelp shells that almost like they they've just piled up over the years and it's just like a big pyramid of shells that have just continually keeps getting added to it's quite quite bizarre really nothing in them but they're just slowly piling up on on the seabed and there's another one of anemone wall so on, on with our show so the next stop is a shipwreck called the charna and i don't know whether Many of you will have heard of the Charners. It used to be a dive boat that used to go up to St Kilda. I know I know divers in the local area that have dived off this boat and have now dived onto it uh, on this dive. And I have to say, if if you do come and do this dive, please do come pop in and say hello because I actually live on the shore just opposite it. So this is my local this is my local wreck um, here. So it's it's a very shallow wreck. It's in 10 10 meters of water at the at the hull with the deck being around six what's really nice is that you can either swim out it's a fair swim out to a buoy and drop down 
or you can actually drop down from the shore and if you're good with your compass it's great for navigation skills um actually go and try and hit this wreck underwater because there's there's so much incredible marine life actually i i now prefer going along the seabed and seeing what i see to the onto the wreck rather than just doing the wreck or i'll you know swim up over it drop down and swim back to shore as well it's a really nice sight um at the minute so it is on fin strokes we've recently updated it however there is one more addition in that there is now a boat attached to the buoy that the charna is on and the guy who owns that boat also owned the charna so he's just using his buoy and so far it's been okay he's had divers on there and he's had no problems with them he's not on it. it's not being used it's just being kept there so it's perfectly safe does make for a, quite an atmospheric dive though when you've got one above and one below you when the tight when the um when the vis is good so you're looking at this is the shore entry and swimming out to the buoy or dropping down onto it what's nice is that the seabed actually bowls down to about 13 meters and there's a really nice bank of mussel shells so this is the site of an old mussel farm my neighbor was a mussel farmer um mussels there are no longer grown but the remnants of the site is all there and there's a lot of mussel debris on the seabed and that's produced a lot of habitat for other animals to grow on. So there's a lot of shell debris with sea squirts, with sponges, with hydroids, bryozoans all growing off it, which is really nice to see. And because it's, so you can come on this dive sometime, because it's so brackish, because there's so much fresh water, you can actually get that halocline even down at 10 meters, you can start to see the shimmer. Um, but you'll see that you get all these very amazing shapes and, and, and morphs of, of the sponges down there, different species as well. And you'll get sea squirts growing on every single surface. Um, lots of different types growing down there. Started getting this little fuzzy um, bryozoan growing as well, which has turned out there's a lot of nudibranchs loving it as well. Particular favourite is you... I only found these a couple of times, started seeing the shells at first, but then started seeing the, the live individuals as well of the uh, ocean cohog, Arctica Atlantica, um, which is actually one of the longest lived, well, longest known lived non-colonial animals. There was one age, which you can age by, by aging the rings on them, and there was one aged at 507 years old. It's quite phenomenal to think that there are potentially others of the same age that are still lying in the seabed, um, you know, that are, that are from that same era. So it's a very distinctive uh, bivalve mollusk, and you only end up seeing this the siphon out of the water, but you might more often see the dead shells of these Arctic. They're very big, very round shells. And if I was at home, I'd show you one. All this fluffy weed, you get lots of nudibranchs growing on it. But uh, these are solar powered sea slugs, slightly different, um, called pistobranchs, which are slightly different to the normal nudibranchs, but they, they just look like starry skies, they're absolutely beautiful. And they, yeah, there's another one there. Uh, we get these big gurnards, which kind of use like, they almost look like they've got feet that they used to crawl along on the seabed. These beautiful bryzoans, these spongy fingers, um these only just started growing what's nice is that you keep going into the site each year and seeing new things um, develop in there and um, these have only just popped up over the last year or so nice big big rays as well thornback rays on the seabed found a couple of eggs actually as well on the seabed um, not wanting to keep you here all night because i appreciate i'm talking for a very long time um i'll carry on going north now so we're going north up to Loch Creeran, um, which is about 20, 30 minutes north of, of Oban and tends to be pretty sheltered. But we're going to start by looking at the Cregan Inn, which is a pub, quite handily, very nice pub on, on one of the um, less, more exposed parts of Loch Creeran on the outer area. Um, again it's a really nice dive can be done by all experience levels what you can see from this map is that I've, I've highlighted the whole area because you park down here so the pub is here you park as close to the to the railing here i'll show you the railing there's the railing so you park as close to that as possible and then when you enter the site 
you've got the opportunity to either dive all the way around this beautiful rocky bedrock all around to the other side and pop out the other corner or you've got this beautiful seabed that you can go and explore around here and what i tend to do is i come out across the seabed on a nice long neap tide and then do a nice big circular route um, getting to around this point and then looking in and amongst the rocks on the way back you get a very different dive depending on whether you're on the sediment or on the rocks uh, like I say, it is tidal dependent. You, you do want a good slack, a nice neat slack tide. You'll get, you know, at least an hour underwater. And again, you know, once you've had your dive and you've and you've got all your pictures to look at, perfect place to go and sit in and have a have a brew or a, have a after dive pint. Go through your your dive pictures and to have something to eat. So that's the that's the entrance there. Uh, or exit you can do both and then you walk down that little path and then you come to this nice so it was low water when i was there tide does come quite high up but this this pathway this uh ledge here is really handy for getting your fins on and getting prepared to get in the water you can bring your kit down here and pop it on that ledge and then get in the water and you're keeping you can either keep the rock on your right or you can head out and then do a nice big sweep of that bay and this has this is really amazing. I really I really like this dive. I did it quite a lot after the first lockdown um, because I was seeing lots and lots of different marine life that I hadn't actually seen before, including like lots and lots of nudibranchs. So on the this is all on the on the rocky reef side. There are these very fuzzy red sea tur turfy seaweeds and hydroids, and I was seeing lots of different species. Really getting my eye in and seeing lots of these um, on the on the turf there. So it's it's always good to kind of yeah have a look at. And what I love about this site is you can pretty much guarantee like sea cucumbers. These I absolutely love them. Burrowing sea cucumbers. They like look like a tree sticking out of the a tree with no leaves sticking out of the sediment. And they've got each little arm, each little branch has got lots of little thin branches, and they're they're taking particles from the water and they'll take each branch individually and almost like licking their lips like suck it into the central central mouth part and then like scoop it back out again and then put the next one in so they're they're just um, they're just so mesmerizing to watch and i tend to have to get like patted on the back to be like you know come on like let's carry on with the dive because they're they're just so they're just so brilliant to look at you also get a lot of bivalve um a lot of mollusks there so where they you won't see the whole animal you'll just see the siphon and it's really difficult to identify between different siphons so like the but the, the shapes and the colors of them are so nice like so iridescent at times as well and they can be useful to try and id them but it, it, again it can be very hard but you can see there's like two different types here above the sediment you can see it's all kind of like shelly broken bits of of uh, stones and, and shell there and you've got these beautiful beautiful worms um, out of the coming out of the sediment as well and if you're really careful and you, you you don't get too close too quickly they will stay out while you can take a picture as well but I mean one you know one false move this is why I say good buoyancy skills because one false move and everything just like sucks back up into the sediment and all you see is like bits of dust coming up around you so we've got some more nudie branks you get horse mussels at this site so really big big mussels with lots of other life growing on them. These beautiful sponges where you can see the structure of the sponge, like these little thin tendrils coming through it. Really beautiful. Lots of different crustaceans as well. So crabs, this beautiful one, and these bright red eyes. And we get bobtail squids. Um, what was really nice on this one dive was that I'd been out on the sediment, seen these adults, went and was looking on the, on the rocks and then found some eggs. So that was really nice. These are probably not that far from hatching at this point. They tend to look like like little black grapes. Um, and apparently I was told that as they get lighter and lighter like this, then they approaching hatching point. I know that there's potentially some nice new bobtails swimming about. And we've got these beautiful scorpion fish. Um, or sea scorpions. There's a few different different species that you can see, but have these most striking colors and patterns on them they're all different i've got some more nudibranchs 
this is a, a type of sea scorpion um, which is less, less known, less seen and less ID, uh, less recorded than others. It just gets mistaken for, for another species. So this, I'm seeing a few more of these about and they're just slightly different to the, the other two species of, of sea scorpion that are more likely to see on the dives. These nice boring, so these here, these little discs are all little sponges that are bored into the rock and they're called, they're not dull, they're boring because they're, they've bored into that rock there. This nice uh, corrugated crab here, another one, uh, you don't see as often as the more commoner species. So again, this site is really, really interesting. You see a lot of different marine life that you don't see elsewhere. I love this spider crab, the fact that for some reason, part of its uh, carapace had gone uh, blue. So it had this had this pink encrusting algae and this blue um, lying on its on its shell, which is just really striking for a photo. So we're coming nearly coming to the end now. Um, this is a kind of a staple dive, very easy, very. If if the, if everywhere else is undiveable, you can always guarantee you can get a dive at Queen Reef, is what we say. So this is always our plan F. If everyone else goes to pop, um, there's multiple dive options in it. It's nice and sheltered. It's within the inner lock of Loch Cairn. You don't need. You can go in any state of the tide. It doesn't have to be slack water. It tends to be cooler. It tends to be darker because it's more enclosed. Um, but you get a mix of muddy sediment and these bedrock reefs, again, it's quite handy. There's plenty of laybys, big laybys that you can fit your cars. However, there's no facilities here and it can, <coughs> can sometimes feel quite remote. Um, phone signal has improved a fair bit lately. It also gets a couple of additional names called the 13 steps and because there are 13 steps or there were 13 steps. And it also gets called the fifth layby because it's, it is the fifth lay-by. And what's great is that four, three, two, and one are all also diveable as well. So there's plenty of options within Loch Craven, but this Queenie Reef tends to steal the show um, because of its queen scallops. And this is really, I haven't got a video, I couldn't find a video in time to really show like how many scallops there are here. But if you can imagine, if you get into the water in about five or six meters of water, and all of a sudden everything around you starts dancing all these little queen scallops are moving and into the water column and dancing around you moving about it is it is a really fun dive and what i love about queen scallops is that they, they have so much life actually on their shells that there's so many other communities of animals living on there that you could i, I tend to take a, too many photos of scallops as you can see here all with different sponges. They've got barnacles on them. There's little seaweeds growing out of them. There's um, there's worm crusts growing off, pink encrusting algae. There's just there's just so much that you can actually see on a shell of of a of a scallop. You also get these beautiful um, pythons. They're called. They look a bit like a wood louse, um, and they tend to like suck onto the onto the rocks and um, there's lots of different species of those. They're very hard to tell apart, but they have these beautiful colours and beautiful markings on them that can really help you um, ID them. Loads of squat lobsters. It's a really, it's a good place to go and get a nice, they, they tend to play ball here and they'll, they'll sit and, and let you take lots of nice pictures of them. And this is a really nice uh, marine worm that I took a picture. I've never seen one before, uh, especially not at this site. And there's some nudibranch eggs. So lying on some pink encrusting algae there there's also a little um crinoid coming up out of here very young feather star and there's all sorts of other little short encrusting turf on that rock a uh, nice little spider crab and some um sea squirts and feather stars as well and they're just they're beautiful the way they move around in the current lots of dog whelks especially this time of year they're all getting a bit jiggy and um, there's lots of whelk eggs lying about on the rocks. They, they tend to form these like huge piles of, of whelk, um, so they've, they're really easy to spot. And these beautiful burrowing anemones that can be all different colours in the central disc as well, they'll be found on the muddy sediments. These beautiful sponge crabs um, that they 
they'll tend to pluck little bits of sponge and, and bits of seaweed and have them like kind of stuck up off their off their carapace. Quintessential sea log anemone um, with some circulid. So this is a circulid worm, um, which are these like they're also called organ pipe worms. They have these like they tend to look like organ pipes. They have this little central plug that plugs over them. Some more beautiful anemones just it's just a really nice dive. There's lots of different life here. And again, when you compare the inner lock crew and to the outer lock crew and the different animals that you see there as well, it's really interesting. If you do one dive one and one the other, you come back having seen like so many different animals. And you get the occasional fireworks anemone in that there's two known fireworks anemones in Loch Ruin and they, they've not moved for many many years and you just go in and go yep they're still there the ones in around 15 and ones in around 18 meters and they're absolutely beautiful that's one of our priority marine features that I had on that earlier slide and what we found recently is a couple of these imperial anemones and they basically look like an that it's not enclosed in that is an anemone that pretty much someone's looks like someone's chopped off all of its tentacles and they just have these tiny little bald tentacles um but they're beautiful beautiful little little anemones there and this one was hiding underneath a horse muscle shell and you can always guarantee there's two congas hiding in the in the rocky reef this one was happily posing away for this photo and there's your old organ pipe hydroid there with its with its um its feathery feeding tentacles out and its central plug there. So if you, these are the ones that don't tend to stick around. You may, you don't even breathe and they'll suck back into their tube, but they're absolutely beautiful. And they're really, they, they used to be found in Loch Crearin in these huge reefs. I haven't gone into it in any detail, but there was some reefs um, that are forming some natural degradation basically. And they're starting to now slowly build back up again. Again, they are one of those, they're reforming, they, they enable a lot more animals, a lot more diversity over sites because you have this structure and the substrate for other animals to attach to and feed from. So they're really important. So that's, that's my whistle stop tour of some of the dive sites. I, I really hope you enjoyed it. I really hope it's inspired some of you to kind of, if, if, if you've if you come to Scotland a lot, if you if you come diving up here, if you go boat diving, maybe you'll come and have a couple of shore dives, or maybe you'd like to find out more different dives. Feel free to contact me in any channel that you wish. They're all on here. I'd be more than happy to come out diving with you and your groups if you come up here and and just just yeah any any more additional information I can I can help with. Um, I haven't plugged sea search in, in any way at all, but if, if it's something that you're interested in, in, in either learning how to complete the sea search forms or wanting to know more about sea search and what we do and how we collect data on marine life around Scotland and around the UK, then just say, just give me a shout. Um, and thank you. Thank you for again for inviting me.